Nick Majerison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. Time now for the second in our EBPOM 2018 series of podcasts. This is the second talk that was given on the 4th of July at EBPOM 2018 at the Institute of Engineering and Technology. It's Ramani Munasinger with the Perioptive Quality Improvement Programme, PQIP for short. Have a listen. Top Med Talk. So our next speaker, enormous pleasure to introduce a colleague and friend, Professor Ramani Munasinger, who's going to talk to us about the Perioptive Quality Improvement Programme, or PQIP. Ramani, welcome. Thanks, Monty. Good morning, everyone, and really grateful for the invitation to come and talk to you this morning about PQIP, the Perioptive Quality Improvement Programme, which is a national endeavour in the United Kingdom, supported by the Royal College of Anaesthetists and the Health Foundation, which is a charity whose aim is to improve the quality of health and healthcare in the United Kingdom. I'm going to cover these four areas. A little bit about why this, why we're doing this, and why now. Some early findings. I think we're about a fifth of the way through our plans. So some early findings from year one. What we have learned, both as a community of perioptive clinicians, but also some learning for me and the rest of the team that are leading the programme from the centre, and what we're going to be doing in the future. So, improving perioptive care. You're going to hear a lot, of, obviously, about perioptive medicine over the next couple of days, and also about quality improvement. I'm really looking forward to Carol and Rupert's presentation in a few minutes. But I think I've tried hard to distill down what I think the key challenges in perioptive care are at the moment. Uh, and these are knowledge and knowledge mobilisation, so what we should be doing and how we spread that word effectively. And the second is treading a tightrope when we think about improving perioptive care between quality assurance and quality improvement. And I'll come on to define and talk a little bit more about those in a moment. So thinking first of all about knowledge and knowledge mobilisation. So we can break that down into these four categories. What are we doing? What should we be doing? How do we feel we need to change? And how do we actually affect that change? So the first of these, you kind of think we should know this, shouldn't we? What are we doing? How are we delivering care to patients? What are our outcomes? How reliable are our processes? But we know from our own personal experience that actually our knowledge about this is quite limited in some settings. Here are three examples of programmes which have been set up in the United Kingdom and elsewhere to try and understand what we're doing with the aim of measuring for improvement. So uh, the left-hand side shows last year's National Emergency Laparotomy Audit report, and you'll hear a lot about NELA over the next day or two. In the middle is the NHS Safety Thermometer, which was a government initiative to measure and therefore improve the rates of four key safety hazards. And these were harm from falls, venous thromboembolism, uh, urinary uh, infections associated with catheters, and bloodstream as uh, infections associated with central lines. And on the right-hand side, the Mashing Michigan project, which was about reducing central line infections at scale in intensive care units. So these were all projects that are, and are all projects that are about measurement for improvement. Because we don't necessarily know what we're doing. And it's interesting to me that surgeons often don't know, for example, what their complication rates are. In particular, really common complications. The top two most common complications, we believe, are surgical site infections and post-operative pulmonary complications. And we don't necessarily measure these routinely in every hospital in the UK, and certainly not internationally. Also, what should we be doing? This comes down to knowledge mobilisation, evidence-based medicine. We're all sitting here at the Evidence-Based Perioptic Medicine Conference, but we represent a tiny, tiny proportion of people working in healthcare in the United Kingdom. We also, even those that come to conferences like this regularly, represent a very small proportion of knowledge mobilisation. So we will take, hopefully, some new knowledge home with us, but then we have to persuade our colleagues that they need to change their practice as a community in order to try and make patient care better. And then we come across this problem, and this is a very familiar normal distribution to most of you, I'm sure. This is the bell-shaped curve that was described by Everett Rogers in 1962 when talking about the diffusion of innovations. And you think about your department at home, and you can probably categorise your friends and colleagues into one of these groups. 
the innovators, the people that are always enthusiastic to try and change and improve, and perhaps sometimes trying to really, really be experimental about how they should do things. The early adopters, the early majority, and then all the way through to the 16% of people approximately that are laggards. So it doesn't matter how much evidence you provide them with, they will find a way of not changing. Now, knowledge translation has improved over time, certainly since the 1960s, as a result of, for example, more of these sorts of events, the internet, lots and lots of other technological advances. But nevertheless, we really do still have a problem with the diffusion of innovation. How do we need to change? So this is all about looking at your own data and understanding what you're doing and where there is room for improvement. And the United Kingdom, we have um, a series of national clinical audits. NILA is one of them. There are others on other diseases, um, such as bowel cancer, and conditions such as hip fracture. And the basic cycle of national audit goes, starting on the top right, you submit some local audit data, which is usually collected by uh, frontline staff, nurses and doctors working in the field. These data are fed back to a central hub, uh, who then analyse the data and feed it back to the local teams. This feedback is delivered by the local leads to their teams. Local teams then make a plan for improvement, and hopefully they then improve using some evidence-based interventions. That's the theory. And how do we change? And that comes back to that last bit of that cycle that I was talking about, because actually this is something that certainly I wasn't taught when I was at university. There is a change in the United Kingdom towards teaching medical students and junior doctors about improvement methodology. But actually, most of us sitting in this room are consultants now, and we don't have a clue about improvement methodology. Small cycles of change, convenient samples, looking at processes, not outcomes, PDSA, all this sort of stuff, it's, it is a foreign language to many of us. Also, understanding context, understanding why at the hospital down the road, their length of stay may well be three days in their enhanced recovery program for cystectomy, for example. But somehow we seem to be completely unable to implement that locally. And why is that? And the likely thing is that we haven't fully understood our local context and what our local barriers and enablers are in order to basically overcome them and affect that change. Do we have the right leadership? Are we trained to lead in this context? There is a, a very uh, interesting theory that instead of uh, very strong, powerful, single people standing up on a stage dictating to people what they should be doing, actually improvement leadership is about uh, a more peloton style of leadership. So changing leadership between different individuals who have a passion for a particular intervention or change, and a quieter style of distributed leadership that includes more people more effectively. But we're not necessarily taught these styles or encouraged to learn them. And then finally, resilience. Uh, we are all people that work in an operating theatre. We have short uh, experiences with the individual patients that we look after in that setting, and then we finish that case or that patient finishes their hospital episode and that is over. So for that patient, our relationship is finished after a few hours or a few days. But actually affecting improvement using uh, quality improvement methods requires real sustainability and resilience. And we have that in our day-to-day -day lives in some respects. But in improvement, that can be really, really hard if you're constantly coming up against the 16% or in some departments more of people who are laggards. And, and, and that is, again, something that we're not necessarily taught to understand or appreciate. <clears throat> so that's knowledge and knowledge mobilization. Our second challenge when it comes to improvement is treading this tightrope between quality assurance and quality improvement. So quality assurance is about making sure that we are all doing the right thing and that patients and colleagues know who is accountable and being transparent about our outcomes. And these pictures will be familiar to all of you who are based in the United Kingdom. They are pictures or screenshots of newspaper articles or other uh, talking about really big scandals in healthcare in the NHS which have blighted us over the last 10 to 15 years. And we all feel sad and we all feel uh, terrible for the patients and there are more coming out every day. There was something in the news yesterday about babies dying and somebody being held accountable for that in a neonatal unit up north. So we are rocked by these sorts of scandals that get rightly to the top of the headlines and everybody is looking to hold somebody accountable for that. And therefore from that we have this culture 
where we need somebody to be accountable, we need to be transparent in the way that we are delivering healthcare, and we need to take responsibility for our processes and outcomes. And while I think these are all really, really important things, there are times that this can be a real barrier to improvement. The key thing here for me as a perioptive care clinician is responsibility. When we work in this environment, in the operating theatre, in the best operating theatres, we work together as a team. There are surgeons, there are anaesthetists, there are nursing staff, and we work together in a team all to try and improve outcomes for the patients. But then when some of our reporting is done, it is attributed to an individual. It is attributed to a surgeon. And that is very, very tough. The top headline talks about the potential risks with that approach, both in terms of uh, being harmful to surgeons and how they practice, and misleading, more importantly perhaps, misleading to patients. Because just being able to see that a surgeon is not more than two standard deviations from the mean, if the outcome is very rare, you're not going to be able to pick up adverse outcomes using that sort of methodology very easily. So patients might actually be falsely reassured that their surgeon is really good. On the bottom, this is an ambiguous uh, title to an excellent paper that was published in the British Medical Journal a few months ago. And this uh, tells a different story. So this was an analysis of data published in a national bowel cancer audit over several years, looking to see whether the publication of individual surgeon mortality data had led to a change in practice, any sort of gaming, and in fact they found that that wasn't the case. So accountability, transparency, responsibility... On some occasions, that can actually be translated through to blame. And this is a great quote, or a couple of quotes from Don Berwick, who is one of the godfathers, as you know, of quality improvement. And it talks about any good leader understands how clever their workforce will be when they are threatened. And actually, they will seek to prove that they are not deficient when they are blamed by not through understanding what is going on, but trying to escape from the spotlight. And this is a great paper in a journal that none of us would normally read. It's a social sciences paper. But it looks at the NHS safety thermometer, which I mentioned earlier, which was set up as a quality improvement initiative, not a quality assurance initiative. But it was financially incentivized. Frontline staff did the data capture about how many patients got DVTs and so on and so forth. And the data were publicly reported at hospital level, regional level, and so on. And as a result of that... The program theory, which is the underpinning theory that the team that developed the program had, which was this is a QI endeavor at scale. We're not looking to apportion blame or do anything like that. So the top is a quote from a member of the team that set it up. And then the bottom is a quote from a frontline member of staff, which talks about the fact that despite those intentions, they felt scrutinized and they felt that it was about blame. And this, there's a lot of writing on this. But this is some of the the key findings from the report, and they come down to the fact that despite best intentions, it was perceived as a blame allocation device. It meant that the participants looked to try and get out of being blamed through various different means. It was a real challenge, therefore, to actually using measurement for improvement. And the bottom one, of particular interest to me, setting up the PQIP program with others, a well-intentioned program theory, while necessary, may not be sufficient for achieving goals for improvement, dominated by institutional logics that run counter to the programme theory. So to put it more succinctly, it doesn't matter how hard you try, there is ingrained institutional memory that means that any sort of improvement programme might be perceived as something that is there to apportion blame. Now, how to address challenges in improvement come down to working with people, culture and engagement, data and monitoring, and doing it in a sustainable way, avoiding projectness and so on. And so when we set up the perioptive quality improvement program, we had three aims, which go back to knowledge and knowledge mobilization and addressing the challenge between QA and QI. The first was to actually understand what we're doing. So in as many hospitals as want to take part, measure evidence-based processes of care, measure morbidity and mortality, measure complication rates for the first time in a systematic way in the UK, look at important patient-centered outcomes such as patient-reported outcome and disability-free survival, and look at failure to rescue, which is very topical in the US and overseas. But the second and perhaps more important goals were to support clinicians in the use of data for improvement and to evaluate the effectiveness of our plans for this QI methodology. So we're looking at major surgery only, using validated process and outcome measures and evidence-based improvement methodology, and trying to really improve the effectiveness of how we use data. So that audit cycle that I talked about earlier 
we've paid real attention to each of those pieces of that puzzle to try and improve the way that we collect the data, deliver it back to teams, support teams in their improvement training and development, and their QI methodology. Dashboards, which give teams near real live updates of their data. Quarterly reports, which give more detailed information about all of the measures that we're taking. Collaborative events, where we get our collaborators together. So we've just had one in London and one in Manchester, with over 250 people involved. And an annual report, which came out a couple of months ago. And the key highlights of this... We've recruited at that time about 6,000 patients. We're now up to over 10,000 in 90 hospitals in the UK. Interesting areas for improvement. So a third of patients didn't have an individualised risk assessment. In the UK, there is a legal imperative to do that now, as well as a moral one. 41% of patients were anemic at the time of surgery. 31% of diabetic patients didn't have an HbA1c measured before surgery. I found that really, really astonishing. Of hospitals that declared their compliance with enhanced recovery broken down by surgical specialties, you'll see there in green the number of patients enrolled in enhanced recovery programs, so most common in colorectal surgery, least common in head and neck surgery. But actually, enrolling patients in programs is not enough, as we know. We need to actually be faithfully doing each of the different bits of an enhanced recovery program, and this also yielded some interesting findings. So less than half of patients overall are getting carbohydrate loading. About 60% of patients actually on an ER pathway are getting it. Lots of patients getting warming in theatres, fewer cardiac output monitoring. The drains and NG tube in recovery thing is variable. And then drinking, eating and mobilising, which you will realise is a process and outcome measure looking at sort of enhanced recovery in a nutshell. And again, not just different rates of drinking and eating and mobilising within 24 hours of surgery, but huge variation between sites uh, on those measures. There's going to be a lot of discussion about perioptic pain at this meeting. 31% of patients are reporting moderate or severe pain in the recovery room. 7% of patients are still receiving parenteral opioids on day 7 while in hospital, which I thought was really high. And then a combination of different short-term outcomes, so patient-reported outcomes. This is a short-term patient satisfaction score looking at anesthesia-specific outcomes. The most prevalent type of severe adverse response to anesthesia is thirst, but it's closely followed by severe pain and drowsiness. And this is the one that gets the attention of the surgeons and the managers in particular. This is the impact of post-operative complications, not risk-adjusted, but the impact of post-operative complications on mean length of stay. So if you just pick one line, so let's say urology at the bottom there, so if you don't have a serious complication, your length of stay is five days, and if you do, it's nearly 20 days. So these findings have led us to isolate five top five national improvement priorities. Teams are encouraged to identify their own deficits and address those, but we're choosing nationally to focus on anemia and diabetes, individualised risk assessment, enhanced recovery, pain management, and dreaming. And why these? We think they're important to patients. We thought they support improved outcomes. And most importantly, we think that they are achievable for everyone. And what have we learned as a project team? Well, the key thing, as always, with everything is communication and communication with the multidisciplinary team, which is quite hard at times. So if you go back to that text I showed you from that paper about the NHS safety thermometer... These are some of the things that we are being told, which is in similar line to those findings. The data are wrong, the sample is biased, our patients are more tricky. So our approach is to take a positive deviance approach, so to not report teams on the basis of their poor outcomes, but to report teams on the basis of their good outcomes. So here is a list of hospitals who, in at least one measure, have achieved greater than 80% compliance or are in the top five hospitals in the country for different things that we're interested in. And what you'll see, for those of you who are familiar with the UK, is these are different types of hospitals, big, small, teaching, non-teaching, rural, city. They're all doing something well. And that's the only thing that we want to focus on, is the hospitals that are doing things well, so that we can spread knowledge from them to other hospitals that are perhaps struggling with something. What next for us? We're evaluating whether all of this effort is worthwhile, using mixed methods, quantitative, qualitative, and health economic We're collaborating widely, so the POMVLAD project is a project that's been set up by one of our fellows as a PhD project to measure continuous risk-adjusted live reporting of post-operative morbidity, which we're trialling in 10 hospitals, and then we'll roll out more widely if it's effective. And the ERAS Plus is a collaboration with a team from Manchester who are looking at implementation of a bundle for post-operative pulmonary complications across Greater Manchester. 
New data, risk prediction calculators, patient reported outcomes and long-term survival are around the corner, but our most important priorities are these, to improve care for patients, to provide better information for patients through uh, understanding what their longer-term outcomes are after surgery, to help us understand how to use data for improvement most effectively, and to improve capability amongst local teams for improvement methods. That's our website. If you're not already involved, please do join us. And this is the team that are doing all the work. Thanks for listening. Top Med Talk. And don't forget you can meet the Top Med Talk team. All you need to do is turn up at one of our events. Check out ebpom.org for more details. Ebpom.org. Our next big event is between the 28th and the 30th of September in Chicago. That's EBPOM USA, the Chicago Masters course, perioperative care practicum. Between the 28th and the 30th of September, EBPOM.org for more details. That's EBPOM.org.